So thanks for coming, first of all. This presentation is going to be 80% about configuration management. Uh, we'll get into what that is and how that all works. But Amazon EC2 is really kind of the, the business case, the use case for the configuration management. Um, I think the, the point to make off the top is you can apply the same principles to hard, you know, virtualized systems that you have with Vagrant or VirtualBox or VMware or whatever, or physical hardware that you have pizza boxes in racks. So the EC2 aspect makes it a little bit more, I, I think, palatable because there's so much need in the cloud, and we'll get into that, to actually take advantage of the cloud rather than just saying I'm using cloud computing. Uh, so we'll dive into it. We're a few minutes behind, so uh, please hold all questions, and then I'll be upstairs right after. And yes, that was in sync. So one big reason why most people jump into configuration management is because they really don't want to administrate their systems. And by administrate, I don't mean you know, checking metrics or looking at Nagios or that kind of thing. Um, application developers, and maybe more so in the last, let's say, decade, they've learned a lot of tricks of the trade that, that they've really developed. Uh, you take uh, GitHub or Mercurial or something like that where you're actually throwing code in. If something breaks, you can actually find out why it broke, who committed it, when it broke. In system administration, we really have kind of played fast and loose with accountability, uh, with how to revert changes gracefully, that kind of thing. So um, we, we really should look at infrastructure as code, and we'll get into how that works with Puppet, because we can take advantage of the same you know, agile mentalities and, and procedures that a lot of developers have that make them a lot more efficient and more useful uh, members of their team. So getting into the same idea, reusable code for managing your, your software and configurations. Uh, you know, some of us maybe, I used to have these FreeBSD build scripts, and it would be one build script, reboot, another build script, reboot, another build. And then if anything broke, you know, I had a couple things to maybe, maybe catch those, but really it was kind of a half-assed job. And the, the reality is we have to do those scripts because we don't have a structure, we don't have a framework to work around. That's kind of what configuration management gives us. So a DSL is just, it's really a language within, probably within some other language that you've developed. Ruby is the base language for how a Puppet's developed, but there's a domain-specific language to actually write um, Puppet configuration. So there's a lot of primitives out there, you know, something like a file or a host or a computer. Within Puppet, you define it within Puppet, not within Ruby. Uh, so the, the learning curve in the case of Puppet's actually pretty, uh, pretty slim. Classes, conditional, selectors, variables. There's a lot you can do in Puppet that if you were just a normal day-to-day -day programmer, you'd probably find pretty comforting. You can do you know, scoped classes. You can inherit um, different classes. So there's, if you have any scripting background, any, any real experience as a programmer, this is super, really, really easy. There's not a whole lot of learning curve there to actually have to pick up on. Ubiquity is probably one, uh, one major reason anyone picks one product over another. Linux, Solaris, BSD, OS X. Windows is in the process. The Windows support for Puppet right now is essentially you can make sure a file's there. Uh, it's not all that glorious. They are working pretty hard because obviously if you can have a really cross-platform product to manage all of your systems, that's pretty impressive. One thing that's coming out that they just announced with the Puppet project two days ago is actually management of Cisco and Juniper gear so you can actually have your SSH string authenticate, set up your VLAN, set up your interfaces, and do that in the same method that you're going to ma manage the actual servers. So Luke, Luke Nice, uh, he's the CEO of Puppet Labs. He's a guy that really wasn't, he was a sysadmin, but I think his major was like chemistry or something. Like He wasn't really focused on solving these kinds of problems. He just kind of fell into it, found a need. And if any of you guys... Uh, We'll talk about them a little more in a second, but CF Engine, if any of you guys were former CF Engine admins, this is the same idea, just taken to a whole other level. They do have money. They, uh, they're hiring pretty quickly. They just hired a guy who was the, really the number one Mac OS X puppet guy in, in the community. They don't just you know, go after resumes. They go after actual, you know, what's, your, what's your Git commit history to our project? How much are you talking about? How many presentations are you giving? And those are the guys they're giving job offers to. So you're getting really passionate people on a team that already has a great product, and you know, when you have the money behind it like that, uh, they're, doing, they're doing okay for themselves. They're based out of Portland, by the way. So see, uh, anyone CF Engine former admins? Anyone? Man, okay. Um, so CF Engine, uh, I think three now, was a 
pretty much a complete rewrite. It's a lot closer to Puppet in terms of what it can do and how it operates. Chef is a great project. It was actually started by some Puppet users and kind of, I, I wouldn't say forked vaguely, but um, Chef actually is a Ruby language for configuration management, whereas Puppet is a DSL, you actually program Ruby to use Chef. So there, there are some distractions there, I think, um, personally, to kind of get in and actually just deploy it. Um, the Chef guys, the, the company that runs them is actually OpsCode, but Chef's their product. Great guys, another awesome product. I'm just, it's one of those things like distros, you know, you eventually usually just pick one and kind of run with it. Puppet's the one I ran with. And they definitely have some people behind them. There's a lot more on their website, but Sun, Stanford, um, well, Sun, we can probably put Oracle there, but uh, Stanford, Match.com, Media Temple, Dig, um, and there's a lot of other companies out there. Uh, Simple Geo, uh, location-based service company out by Colorado, uh, they're using Puppet as well. So we'll take you in and kind of get the overview part out of the way, and then hopefully that, man, those used to be blue up there. Um, and get the high level overview, just so you guys get an idea of what's ha actually happening up here. So the Puppet Master, and, and you don't have to run in a client server model, you can actually run these, these configurations, or manifests as we call them, actually on the clients. The more common model, I think, is to have a, the client slave relation, or a, the uh, client master relationship. So on your Puppet Master, you'll have modules and, and you'll have the configuration. Um, in terms of the cloud or in terms of any, in, any infrastructure really, you might have some basic units, some basic building blocks for a, an infrastructure. You'll have your monitoring, DNS, syslog, LDAP. And then if you're a, a development shop, this is pretty common, or hopefully this is common. I, I do work with some clients that actually really don't have anything but production. Um, but you, you might have a development, test, review, and, and uh, prod type staging. So you, you, have a, you have this puppet master that knows about all of these things. They know, uh, it knows what it's supposed to look like, you know, what packages are supposed to be there, what files are supposed to be there, what the file, man, or what the file configuration actually looks like line by line, uh, does it check some. The problem is in a normal infrastructure, um, it, it can get a little bit hairy. Someone's gonna make a one-off change, forget to tell you, forget to comment something, and all of a sudden you, you don't have consistency in your environment anymore. And that's a huge problem because it usually takes more legwork to find out what one change was made that no one mentioned than it is to actually, if you knew, fix it. Um, so in, in scope of this, the, these are all the Puppet clients. You have all your, you know, they, again, they could be cloud instances, they could be uh, pizza boxes in a rack. It doesn't really matter. The, the idea here is that you're managing a whole infrastructure, not just little slivers of it. So from a network perspective, it's pretty simple. Um, the Puppet Master is basically listening uh, on 8140. The, the clients themselves actually can be forced to run. And by, whenever I say run today, there's going to be some some terminology that's, especially with the easy two part, that might not be straightforward. If you're really confused, just yell at what the hell that is and I'll explain. Um, but running uh, with, with regard to Puppet is actually the configuration, synchronization, and the application of what your configuration should look like. So the, with the Puppet Master running, um, generally what you're gonna do is every 30 minutes is, is kind of a common, uh, common point, every 30 minutes, the client will see if the master has anything new for it or if the, if the client hands, uh, basically you have a manifest that says what X, Y, and Z should look like. If X, Y, and Z don't match, it fixes it to look like that. Pretty straightforward, uh, at least on the end user side. Obviously a little bit more complex on the uh, actual puppet side. So configurations allow for manual synchronizations or a set in increment, like I said, 30 minutes is kind of a, a general rule. Um, Client or server initiated, depending on which way, if you're pushing or pulling, it's still gonna be doing the same job, it's just how you're initiating that, that uh, transaction. Client server configuration actually has a CA. You can use your own CA if you want, maybe have an intermediary CA bounce off that, and then start assigning all these clients, um, you know, validate their CSR, sign them, and you can tie this all into your existing um, PKI. By default, just kind of an out of the box situation, you'll actually create a CA and it'll, Usually it's gonna auto-generate for you. Create a CA, and then every client that wants to connect will actually hand over a CSR. Your CA will sign it, we'll get into that in a second. And now you have a, you know, this SSL connection, obviously, to ensure the efficacy of the data that you're tran um, transferring. So everything uh, bet between master and client are encrypted. 
there's the cute puppy. Um, so this is maybe my jaded perspective, uh, a little bit on, on being an EC2 admin for a while without this kind of stuff. So the AMI, the, the Amazon machine image, is essentially, if any of you have worked with any virtualization, is essentially your, your OS image, so your Zen image. EC2 is Zen-based, so that's kind of what, what they're working with. Um, once you build it, number one, you have, you have this system that you're probably like, you know, mounting and shrouding into this, uh, this, this file that you created on disk and you've updated it and you've changed configs. When you're done with that, as far as Amazon goes, you're gonna close it up, it's gonna split it into, you know, 60 pieces, upload the pieces over, you know, SSL to Amazon, they're gonna recompile it, you're gonna register the AMI. It's a lengthy process for a, you know, five gig uh, image, we'll call it. I mean, you, realistically, you're talking about an hour, hour and a half every time you just, Every time you decided, oops, I forgot that file, or I should have uncommented that one line, that's not really a sustainable way to work. <laughs> uh, I can say that from experience and frustration. So building and deploying, like I said, is pretty time consuming. And I, th I mean, this is pretty much how I felt at a certain point with working with Amazon. Like, we, we can't just update a file. I mean, this is, you, you, you know, the end user or the person you're working with on your team or your, your administration, um, they're gonna say, well, we have to add this one line to Etsy password. And I'm gonna say, no, we're not gonna spend another hour and a half trying to get this thing up in the cloud and try to, you know, it, it's, it's very exhausting and it makes, I think a lot of this talk, and I actually have another talk that kind of pulls us in about development operations, but the promise of the cloud, at least what the marketing people wanna make it, is that the cloud can change everything. The cloud has the potential to change everything you can't take your old you know, mindsets and your old metho methodologies and apply them one-to-one -to, -one to the cloud unless you did shit really well and it'll actually work. Um, so we're starting to rethink it and configuration management's a, a huge component of that. You can auto-scale in the cloud. You can add instances, you know, as, as many as you really want as long as you have credit cards and an agreement with Amazon or Rackspace Cloud or whomever. But if you can auto-scale, what does that really mean? If, if I can buy a bunch of boxes from Dell and get them overnighted, Where's my advantage there? I still have to stage them, I still have to set them up. I, there's configuration, I have to make sure things are synchronized, I have to rsync a bunch of data to over. You're really not getting much in, in practicality if you don't actually auto-scale. You can say you're auto-scaling, you can have servers on demand, but you're really not auto-scaling. Um, so, so time to deploy and configure offsets the ben benefits of infrastructure as a service. If, if you're not actually auto-scaling, you're not actually using the cloud for anything worthwhile at least in the case of uh, infrastructure, infrastructure as a service. So Puppet's really kind of this, um, it, it fills this desperate need for administration to actually deliver on what we think the cloud should be for us. So deployment of a base EC2 um, AMI, essentially you'll have you know, maybe like Vim on there or, or Emacs if you're so crippled, um, you might have uh, well, you'll obviously have the Puppet software that helps a lot too if you're gonna automate things. Um, and you're really just like the base stuff that you'd have on any image across any server. If you can't say every server should have this, get it off. Uh, once you have that, and this is just an application that I kind of divined through my experiences and I'll kind of explain later how this all fits in, but an EC2 security group is essentially a set of firewall policies for an EC2 instance. So if you put a uh, instance of, you know, some piece of uh, virtual hardware on in EC2, you can actually have this like network layer firewall on top of your host based firewall if you're so inclined. So the, a security group, the, the reason why it's important and the reason why I've utilized it is because it has a name. And if you think of DNS or you think of monitoring or you think of Nagios, these are all names and usually a server that fits into that classification you're gonna share firewall rules. So you're gonna set, you know, have a existing set of firewall rules for, for Nagios. In the case of Puppet, you can use that same context, that same metadata that explains what this server, server is to kind of be the pivot point on how you actually apply a system and how you create something from nothing. I have a coworker that's actually, his career path was actually in biology and he just loved system administration, kind of did uh, 180 and went into that. But we were talking about it and in a lot of ways, it's really kind of like the stem cell mentality that you can create anything as long as you have the right base component. In our, in our point of view, the right base component is this really minimal EC2 AMI, and then from that, you define what you want and the rest happens um, 
I can't say magically, but it, it happens pretty sweetly. Um, the package that you couldn't update before because it took an hour and a half or the file that you forgot to uncomment one line is no longer a problem. So this is a, a new EC2 puppet client. So you, you instantiated an instance on EC2. It's, it's there, but what happens? So you start it up. Uh, puppet is going to spawn on boot. You know, it's just another init service. When it starts for the first time, it's going to go through some you know, kind of unique processes. Uh, it's going to generate CSR. It's going to generate pu you know, pu public private key pair, all that kind of good stuff for SSL. Um, that actually should say CSR. Well, I guess both is fine. Um, the client's going to send the master that CSR. You get the signing. So that's really the only point so far that the master's actually interacted with this client. And then where it says synchronize, that's the same as this run idea, that it's going to say, what am I? What am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to work? And that's where the, the really magic happens as far as what Puppet does. And so this is the, the general overview of what's going on, and then we're going to get into how it goes on. The SSL thing is kind of tricky because uh, if you're thinking about auto-scaling, you're auto-signing these CSRs. How do you auto-sign a CSR for a host that you really don't have any assurances might be a valid host, it might be within the scope of what you want to sign, because you're opening yourself up to attacks if you're signing and giving the secure channel with some, obviously some trust. Um, within Puppet, there are multiple ways to do this. You can actually do domain scope, so you can say if this you know, host has a valid reverse DNS of blah, sign it. I don't think that's a great idea, personally. Uh, <laughs> Maybe when we get DNSSEC uh, implemented everywhere else, but right now I don't think that's a, a great way to go. This is uh, the, the secondary one, is actually the one I traditionally go with, with within EC2. I'll explain this briefly. So when the client starts and that init, init script runs and you create the, the SSL stuff that you need, the actual init script ha um, is going to secure copy a file over to the Puppet Master in just some like innocuous directory you know, ch root or whatever, and it's going to have the uh, uh, just kind of like a shared private key on all of these on the on the base AMI. So that shared private key is going to have the authority to actually make the connection. Um, now, the reason why I said you know shrouded or you know if you're doing uh, current SSH is because worst case scenario, maybe they can get files onto that system, but at least they should be relegated to where they're at. And if you set things up right in your systems. Know, for, for various reasons, like no exec, no suid, no, you probably can do things pretty well. Um, and then on the, on the master side, it just looks in that directory every minute. If it sees a new CSR, because it knows it came over securely, it knows it came over with authenticity to, a, to an extent, uh, it's going to automatically sign that one. So you, you add a trust relationship that you wouldn't have by just blanketly trusting DNS. You can auto-sign everything. That's a terrible idea. And you can manually sign. Manual, um, Signing for the CSRs isn't, it's really not terrible, but it's not practical in the cloud. I, that's kind of, again, the, the theme here. At, at your office that you know like a pallet of Dell servers are coming in, you can start them all up at the same time, do that, and yeah, you can maybe manually do it. But if you're looking to auto scale things 24-7, 365, you're probably not going to want to be the guy that wakes up at 4 a.m. because you hit a, a load spike, and now you have to manually sign something. Again, it should be automatic. So the Puppet module, um, and this is actually like the folder structure that we're looking at now. The module uh, is just generally a common name. So if you're thinking about bind, for instance, you might have a, a folder called bind. Um, I'll just put these up here really quick. Manifest, uh, manifests are really the configuration management. It's really the instruction set that dictates within that domain-specific language what's going on. Files are literally just static files. If you have a file that you want to copy over, you put, put it in files, and then you can later point to it, and it'll copy that exact file over. <coughs> Templates are quite cool, and they actually, they're one of my favorite parts of, uh, of Puppet, and you can do, do the same thing in Chef. These are Ruby-interpreted uh, templating files, so uh, .erb if anyone's familiar. These templates, if you have something like this metadata for every single host, you can actually loop through that metadata and auto-generate like an Etsy host list, or you can populate a, uh, a load balancer like an HA proxy. You can automatically um, load it with all the metadata for all these hosts that talk with the Puppet Master. 
So rather than having static files that you still have to manually tweak, as your infrastructure scales and as things change, when the Puppet Master gets these updates, it'll actually update all the clients. So if you have all these HA proxy instances, all of them will update with only the hosts that are still alive. So that's really getting back to the idea of true auto, uh, automation and scale. And then lib, you can, within, within Puppet, uh, you can really write any library you want. You can, if you know how to write Ruby, and I didn't prior to using Puppet, it's a pretty sweet language. I, I definitely uh, recommend it. The, the Ruby libraries, I mean, two or three lines and you can make almost anything happen within, within that scope. So take a look at that. If you uh, already know Ruby, it might be a, a good extension. Especially if you work on a team, you're the programmer for Ruby, you have sysadmin people, this is a great way to integrate the two teams and actually kind of uh, create a little bit more cohesion. So partial list of puppet types, and the types is just a broader uh, spec definition, and you'll see what that really entails. Files, directories, users and groups, services, packages, cron tabs, Etsy host, mail I'm just going to stop reading now. <laughs> okay. So these are just a, sh a small example of what types are. And so if you want to define what a file looks like, what permissions it should have, uh, who the ownership is, whether it's suit or not, or if you want to establish a directory should always be there, you can do that. You can define users, you can define groups. The Nagios one's cool, and we'll get into a, a screen of that later, but Nagios is natively supported by Puppet. You can actually auto-generate your Nagios configuration. You'll never have, and I, I literally mean you'll never have to actually edit Nagios again. And I don't know about you guys, but you know, maybe for an 80 host deployment, I'll have upwards of 18 or 1900 different service checks between those 80 hosts. It's a pain in the ass to try to go line by line, figure out where you messed up, which one you forgot, and God forbid you actually forget to add a host. And now there's this guy out there that you're supposed to be monitoring and taking care of, and you just forgot. This is gonna automatically let you not forget. So YUM repositories, SSH sheets. So you get, you get the scope that you can really manage pretty much everything on your system. And again, this is a partial list. Package providers, when I say package providers, uh, literally RPM, YUM, apt. Um, and then on the Mac OS X side, uh, DMG files. So you can manage really anything you can think of. You saw the platform list earlier of what's supported. Any package provider within the scope of that is really gonna be supported by, by Puppet. The abstraction is pretty much key because when you write a module, you don't want to have to write a module for Solaris, you don't want to have to write a module for Linux, you don't want to have to write a module for Mac OS X. If you say install this, you know, this package, uh, Apache, if there is an Apache package, whether it's in yum or it's an apt, it knows you want it because it knows what system it's on. So you take away having to make really one-off crappy hacks just to allow a package on one platform to work on the other. So you get to have one module that kind of rules them all, do it once correctly, and now you can apply it to anything. You can do uh, installed, absent, latest for the package. So if you have a package that you want to ensure that every package, every time it sees an update within yum, it will update automatically to that package. You can also specify a specific version string. So if you always want your packages to have the exact same version, without, without question, it can do that. Um, and you can do kind of a quick update. I, there's other ways to do this, and I'll talk about M Collective later. But if you really just wanted to quickly update all your systems and make sure they all update, flip, flip the, uh, the string in there from the install to latest, and it'll actually just upgrade everything, flip it back, and then you're back to your, your current state. The install basically means if it's there, good. If it's not, install it. It has, no, it has no desire or care or concern what versions it's at. It just wants a version of that package installed. Uh, init frameworks, the same idea with packages. Um, so whether it's upstart or, or you know, common init, it's going to control it the same way. You don't have to tell which one it is. Uh, you, can, you can make sure that every time Puppet runs, if a service stopped, it will restart it. Uh, if a service wasn't check config on because you forgot, which happens way too much, uh, it will actually make sure it gets check config on. Uh, the last bullet point on the services one, if a service uh, has a file that's, that's really key to that service, so httpd.conf for Apache. If that file changes, it will automatically tell the Apache service it needs to reload. So, you know, you make a config file change and you go, oh crap, I forgot to reload that yesterday, so the, the change never applied. This will take care of that low-hanging fruit for you. 
ownership permissions. Um, again, going back to the files and templates, you can load content from those directly, or you can actually just inline a string. Symlinks, uh, five different types to do a checksum, so whatever necessity you have, or if you have some really weird, uh, weird reason, you can actually change how it's verifying the, uh, the file is what the file should be. Um, and you can quickly purge a directory if you have something that maybe you were maintaining, but you want to make sure all the systems now are blank for that directory structure. So syntax, uh, this, again, if you have programs at all, a lot of this should look pretty straightforward. You can have a single class, you can do an inherits, you can do nested classes or just straight up scope classes. So the, the hierarchy of how you define modules is pretty straightforward. If, if you're gonna make a NTP module, you'll probably make a class called NTP. You can do selector statements. So um, in this case, based on the user ID, if the user ID is zero, you set the variable admin to root. Uh, this can apply to anything, host names, if you have some auto, automatic host name generation, that kind of stuff. Uh, one, ex one example of the selectors that I've actually implemented is one, one infrastructure has maybe 100 hosts. Most of them have MySQL instances. If anyone configures MySQL, you have a MySQL ID per host. Whenever that host comes back up, this one will actually set a variable to the exact ID it should be, set it in the config file, and now you don't have to free, you know, worry about having duplicate IDs in different hosts, that kind of thing. Conditionals, this is, uh, by the way, you can do else if now. This was a little bit outdated, unfortunately. So you can do uh, quick conditionals, and this is getting back to the EC2 part. Um, that variable is just metadata that's been pulled in from the EC2 metadata that they give, and so, if security groups has DNS in it, you'll make it a bind server. If it doesn't, you'll just install the, the client module. So now you're starting to leverage this, this really simple metadata that you would have already had to say like, yeah, TCP 53 and UDP 53 for your firewall rule set in the security group. Now you've taken that same metadata and now that's the, the basis on how Puppet's designing what a system looks like. Case statements, same idea. And getting back to, you know, if it's a monitoring server, include Nagios. If it's a developer server, include Mercurial. Basic variables, basic math. Um, so it, it may seem like I truncated this or there's not a lot there, but if you think about it, this is really kind of a, uh, a basic module for NTP. And let me put these other files up here. Um, the, uh, excuse me. So on the left side, you see the class statement at the top. We define a package, which is called simply NTP, and we're ensuring that it's the latest. So every time Puppet runs, it's gonna make sure that the NTP package is up to date for whatever repository is giving that data. The service NTPD, we're gonna make sure it's running. So if it stopped because you know, it seg faulted or something, the next time Puppet runs, it'll restart that service automatically. Uh, you can think of things like Monit that you might be running in your environment or other ways to make sure that services come back, or e even event handlers in Nagios depending on how, how much resolution you need for those situations, this can do a little bit of that handling now. Enable it, so check config it on if it's, if it's not already. Um, and then require package, so th um, this is all gonna be basically declarative, so you're gonna require the package NTP before you try to start the service and run the service NTPD. Uh, just logical, logical leaps like that, that if you don't have a package installed, you can't start a service, you basically fill those in or Puppet to tell it how to act. The second part down there, file, um, you, essentially you can see that the, the root of it, root ownership for group and uh, for owner, the mode, the source is the important part. The source is actually just reaching out into that files directory under the module I talked about, and it says, oh, do you have the file called ntp.conf? If so, set that as the value, or set that as the contents on our server for that file. If that file ever gets out of sync, if someone actually fat fingers, accidentally fat fingers or touches that file and deletes whatever, the next time Puppet runs, whatever the differences are, it will resynchronize and make sure that file's in place. The last one down there, and actually I'll say both statements, you see the notify lines. If those files change, either the sysconfig one or the actual ntp.conf, if those change because someone messed it up and it reset it, it'll notify the actual service to restart so that you ensure that you actually have the desired state. Really, Puppet is all about desired state. You say what it should look like, it makes it so. And then over there, those are just obviously basic uh, NTP files, but those would actually be the contents of the, the files directory. This is 
is actually coming up now. There we go. So there's uh, Harry Houdini. And it really does kind of feel like magic the first time you go through this because it, it's really just a simple idea, but sometimes the complexity that we put on ourselves to define what something is, if we already have a firewall rule set that already has a name, why are we trying to make more abstractions? It's, it's already abstracted. So like I said, uh, inbound firewall rules for EC2, that's all a security group is. It has a, you know, a set name. The metadata from EC2, uh, if anyone's ever worked in EC2, there's basically just a, like, like a local uh, resolution URL you can hit, and it'll pull up a bunch of metadata. That metadata can be pulled into something called Factor. Factor is this, uh, we'll call it a tool, and all Factor does is make key value pairs. It says, uh, you know, it has a key called you know, processor zero or something, and the value is whatever the processor zero specs is. It has your free memory, it has your uh, LSB disk, it has your Red Hat release version. So any kind of metadata that really defines what a system is or what it looks like or what resources it has, you can pull in really quickly into Puppet and use all those variables to decide things, to make conditionals, um, so on. So tell Puppet to configure instances based on their security group, we've kind of covered that. And, and it doesn't really not scale, I mean you can, as long as you've defined your, your scope of what a server looks like and how it knows what it should be, there's really no, no limit to that. And then every, every service group you have, as long as there's you know, some basic uh, commonality there, for every service you have, whether it's LDAP or BIND, if it looks roughly the same, sans maybe a couple tweaks per server based on an IP, it runs the same way. So for a DNS EC2 security group, you just have a couple rules. You have you know, 53 for DNS, 22 for SSH. You can quickly just make some modules. So you make an SSH module and you make a bind module. Um, what's There's a lot of things cool. I'll probably say that a bunch of times. Uh, the, the file type actually allows this variable, variable replacement and first use on, uh, use on first match type scenario with files. So if you look relatively closely on there, the first string up there, you'll see EC2 underscore security groups. If there's a file that is literally called DNS dash SSHD underscore config, it will use that file. If there's not, it'll take the next one if that's there. If not, it'll take the next one. So you basically can quickly make um, a, two -line, a two line source entry for this file, and if there's ever a security group specific file, it will always use that. If there's not, it'll default. You can take this to host names, you can take this to architecture. So if you're running x86, uh, 64 versus i686, you can have a specific file based on that architecture and it will include that file instead. So I think I probably should have put that up there a second ago, but you get the idea. Um, so, and this scales as many times as you want. So if you had 40 different types of matches that you wanna do and you wanna do them in descending order, you can do so. Um, so I think I covered the factor one. So here's some examples of what factor has. And again, these are just key value pairs. So architecture, um, you get your IP address for etho. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So something like, uh, something like uptime days, this is a really bad example, I would never do this, but an example of what you could do is take that uptime days variable and with a conditional statement, if uptime days is greater than 30, run some command, whether it's a synchronization, whether it's a deployment, whatever. Um, there's really no limit. The SE Linux, another good one, I don't know about you guys, but every time I do something with SE Linux, I have to step on eggshells because I you know, don't want to break one thing or I forgot to give the right context to another thing. If SE Linux, if SE Linux is installed, you can do conditionals to say, oh, SE Linux is here, I have to set context, I actually have to set a ACLs. Um, and there, there is actually SE Linux support natively in Puppet as well, so you can do those things without having to you know, bounce out to a shell script. OS release, obviously pretty, uh, pretty important. If you're running Cent 5.5 versus 5.6, you might want to know there's a difference. Virtual, is this a Zen host? Is this a physical host? Uh, and then uh, this is kind of a, a th throwaway in, in some cases, but you, you have an, this unique ID for these AMIs, these Amazon machine images you upload, if Puppet talks to one that maybe is kind of out of date, but it's running it, you might need to know that because it might not have certain software the other ones did. So Nagios, uh, I'm gonna put a couple of these up there for you guys first. Nagios again natively supports 
uh, is supported in Puppet. Anything you would create in Nodulous, you can basically create right inside of Puppet using the same kind of primitives like, uh, or you know, you see file, instead of file, it might say Nodulous service. And you could add the host name, you could add the notifications, all that kind of stuff. Um, the one current instance, and I kind of alluded to it earlier, you know, I do currently have 80 hosts with 1,800 checks and not a single one of them was done by hand. The host service groupings, a lot of times, and I'm, I'm guilty of it too, you don't want to have to go through and actually like put hosts in the right service, the right host groups and the right services in the right service groups, and, or make them for, the, for that matter, and this will take away that, that laziness on, from, from your plate and put it into the, uh, the orchestration. Let's see how we're doing here. All right. Um, so this is an example of not just service. The host name up there is just the variable for the host name that you're working with currently. You pass your load averages check, your parameters for what load you're looking for, uh, and then, so if anyone's at configured Nodules, this looks the same as a normal Nodules configuration, except you just have key value pairs defining what a service looks like. What's nice is when you make that one snippet of service, that snippet of service is included for every host. You don't have a thousand snippets. You have one, it, imp it implied, or you imply that it, you should have it on that specific server, and now you've done it a thousand times or a hundred thousand times. It doesn't really matter. Service groups, uh, quick host example. So you pop a host in. Because it has LDAP installed on the system, again, you can just do a con conditional match if you're so inclined, uh, you'll put it in the host groups for LDAP. You could do a regular expression check. So does the host name have LDAP in it? Uh, does it start with LDAP? You can put it in the host group for LDAP now. And then host groups themselves. Um, so I don't work at ePrize anymore, so good for them. Uh, but these, uh, this is a really small example. This is actually an EC2 deployment that they probably don't have anymore. This is probably a good year and a half or two years old now. Um, but you can see up there there's 13 hosts, and in this case there's only 188 checks. But again, none of these checks up there, nothing that you see was touched by hand. All it was was included, not just configuration within Puppet. Um, I'd, I'd like to quickly expound on that because I've done a lot of work lately, and the reason why I have 1,800 checks for 80 hosts versus you know, this kind of uh, ratio. Um, one thing I've been working on, and this is public in a GitHub repository I have, excuse me, there's, there's a, a Ruby library that I've made that actually looks to see if a system has a service check config on. If it has it enabled, it will actually try to include classes within Nagios and within Munin. If a class exists for Nagios or Munin, you will automatically configure a system based on what the system looks like. So you don't have to define even if a service is there. It will check to see if the service is there. You won't forget about a service that you enabled if you disable a service, now it'll remove it from Nagio. So if you just want to shut up one service because that service is just ruined and your other 30 boxes that run the same way are fine, you can just check config that one off and now you don't have a problem anymore. So you can actually automate it even further than just the output of Nagio. So you can actually automate how it knows what should be running. Another example uh, within regard to Munin, those DNS, EC2 dev, LDAP, those are groups that are automatically created based on the groups that are available. So if you have a security group and a host belongs to that security group, it'll actually create the, the grouping hierarchy. It'll add the hosts. You see on like um, the monitoring one, you have Apache as a, a check, but on the other ones you don't. Uh, same thing, same idea with the Nagios work I've been doing uh, with, within regard to services. If there is a Munin Apache class, and you have Apache running on your server, it will automatically add that class, and now you have Munin support for your Apache. Uh, Foreman, I'll kind of get these up here in a sec, but uh, Foreman is essentially just a web interface to interact with Puppet, to interact with your host to look at reports. Puppet generates reports whenever you synchronize to say, did something change? What changed? What should I know? Is something broken? And uh, it's always nice to have some some way to look at that data without having to, you know, grep through lines and hope for the best. Um, I think this might be a good one just to show the image. There you go. So this is kind of just a quick dashboard. There's actually a Puppet dashboard project. This is just another one. One thing that Foreman does is it actually can do provisioning as well. So you can do uh, like kind of kind of cobbler-esque type things. It actually supports virtualization with libvirt. So you can actually deploy Puppet hosts from this web panel initiate them, and then monitor them in the, kind of in the same breath. 
Uh, if you were to click on one of these hosts, you would see all the reports for that host. You could drill down to any report, see what, what failed, what worked. Um, you can change a lot of metadata about them, group them, all kinds of stuff. So it's just a nice way. There's some of the metadata. So the, again, these are all the factor key value pairs. You can kind of just quickly look at those. Um, every time Puppet runs, let's say that you wrote some really, really crappy, uh, recursive, ugly directory thing. And if you looked at, um, at the, uh, the file one, the fourth one down in that list, it took 8.17 seconds to actually run. If it took 80.17 seconds to run, you might be concerned on why it took so long. And you could go in and actually understand why that metric was so high and what you could do to maybe add efficiency to the process. Some quick graphs. These really have never uh, proved very useful, but I think uh, Ohad, who's the, who's the developer, just, uh, you know, it's pretty easy to make a graph, so. Um, really, the, uh, the last major thing, as far as automation, I'm going to talk about, and the idea of configuration management is one component to this problem. But what, what about like the day-to-day, -day, the, the I need to do something now across 10 hosts, not every host? You want a little bit quicker of a way to do that. And you guys use, uh, I mean, really like an SSH for loop ever. You have a list of hosts. You go through, yeah, I, I mean, we all are, I wouldn't say, well, I'd say guilty now, but that's because I know better. Um, or Funk or some Capistrano, all these kinds of orchestration tools. M Collective was, at the time I wrote these slides, was actually a project that integrated with Puppet. Since then, Puppet Labs actually bought, I'll call it the intellectual property to M Collective. They hired the developer of M Collective on full time. He's now a Puppet Labs employee. Again, the community. So, um, services, packages, um, you know, basic, thing like, basic things like ping. And I'll show you an example of this in a second. Say you wanted to restart the service, uh, the Apache service on every host that was 64-bit and every host that had a certain file that existed on the file system. It's a really weird request, but if you've ever been a sysadmin for a lot of developers, there's sometimes things that you have to do to you know, accommodate them. Um, think if you have 1,000 hosts, you have inventory of what those 1,000 hosts are. What if you forgot to update that host.txt list that everyone seems to have? Everyone seems to have this one, like, list on some NFS share somewhere that says every host we have. It's not real time. It doesn't stay up to date. If you forget, you forget. You know, um, what M Collective does at, at a broader level is it's actually this publish subscribe model. I probably have a slide up there somewhere for that. Um, it has a publish subscribe model to how it works. So there's actually a queuing server in the middle of this equation. So it's active MQ, rabbit MQ. Your clients will actually reach out and make a you know, TCP connection to this uh, queue. Your puppet master will also, or, or your, your remote control station, let's call it, will reach out. And when you want some systems to do something, you'll throw a task on the queue. Based on parameters that you define, whether it's an architecture, whether it's a certain package that's installed, it will act accordingly. So if you want to uninstall a package on every 64-bit system, you can do so. If you want to find out every host that you currently have online, you can do so. Um, it's going to actually have a real-time effect on your infrastructure rather than trying your best to remember what your infrastructure is or where your hosts are. Um, here's a good example, uh, just a really quick one. But So you have uh, this MC service, so just M Collective service. You say HTTPD, so whatever service you want, you say status. It'll tell you what the, what the state of those servers are currently. It'll give you a quick summary at the bottom. Excuse me. So the nice thing about M Collective more than maybe some other things is that M Collective is actually, it, it's this RPC framework. Uh, I've personally built modules for managing apps across Debian boxes or Ubuntu boxes. I've made one for Spam Assassin. It's very quick to program. You, it's a little bit of Ruby. And you can now orchestrate anything you can really programmatically think about. So in this case, if I wanted to stop all the servers that had, you know, M, or, uh, that had Apache running, I could. Just change that status to stop. It would apply to every one. This actually takes in any factor data. So if you know the AMI ID for a given instance that you want to stop all those instances right now, you could do that. So any metadata, you can take it in. Any regular expression, you can take it in. So if you have 1,000 hosts or 10,000 hosts, you just define the criteria. It'll do the rest. So another example, MC package. Which of these servers actually have the package? What are the versions? If you're ever wondering if all your systems are up to date, 
run this command, and it'll tell you about the, the one or the two that somehow didn't get upgraded last maintenance cycle. PGREP, um, so if you're looking for process data, you just want to know every server that has the LDAP process running, how much resident memory it has, you can do that quickly. And because you're not making SSH loop, or, you know, these SSH loops, you're not making connections to every single host that didn't exist, you're, you're not forgetting about what private keys you need for which host. Again, this is all over one SSL channel. It's very, very straightforward, very consistent. And then MC find host. You, if you think of that host.txt file, Never again do you ever have to type that. You run that command, and it'll tell you every single computer that's subscribed to that queue, and it'll give you a list. So this is kind of my, uh, I hope it is. Um, so this is a, my, my wrap up, my like, charge for EC2 and how you can make this all work. So you get elastic IPs. Elastic IPs are just static IPs. Every, everything in Amazon has an awesome new term. Um, so you have these 10 static IPs, you have them reserved for a network of hosts that are going to be your core infrastructure online. Uh, each instance starts, and Puppet has an inventory of what these IPs are, just has an array or a hash or whatever, and as instances come up, it assigns an IP. Uh, you guys saw the selector value earlier, so like where it was selector, if your user ID is zero, you, your root. Um, think of the same way now. You have a just quick map of these selectors for an IP yields a certain need. So, you know, dot one is Nagios, dot two is Munin. You bring all these hosts up, as they get an IP assigned and attached automatically, you're now defining what hosts are. You don't care which host is which, you just care that they're, they're hosts. So, hosts become www servers. Um, the elastic load balancer, just think of HA proxy for the cloud. Um, it'll automatically attach these instances to your load balancer now. You don't have to go in and manually check boxes for which host should be which. You're, you're starting up 10 hosts at one time, but the three hosts that are actually your web servers, they'll tell a, the uh, Amazon infrastructure that those are web servers. You know, Nagios, I think we've covered that. It's, it's, it's all done for you. It knows which services are running, how they run, whatever. If an instance dies, Part of the nice thing about EC2 and this whole idea of, of auto-scaling is that if an instance dies in an auto-scale group, a new instance will be created. You can even do something as simple as a 1-1 one, one auto-scale. Always have one instance, never go more than one. To me, that sounds like just really failover, right? If you have an instance that dies, it makes a new one. It doesn't care what the instance was for. So if an instance dies, the next time it starts up, Puppet says, oh, I have one IP left because a host died. It assigns it back it recreates the host that died. You've done nothing. <laughs> You've done absolutely nothing to make any of this happen. You've finally gotten this idea of cloud computing, of auto-scaling, of, of failover. All these things that you, you want to do and that are great for your environment and, and really make uh, EC2 especially useful, you can do. So it, it's really this idea between if you have the resources to do so, because it does take time to implement Puppet. It's, it's not like an overnight thing. There is a Puppet Enterprise version now that you can uh, you know, basically get one, uh, one binary. It'll install it. It'll ask it what it should be. And there's great resources, great tutorials, and the Puppet community is really helpful. They're really not the RTFM community. They're, they're really nice guys, honestly. Um, but it will take time. You'll have to get buy-in. And kind of coinciding with another talk that I mentioned, the, the development operations talk, um, it's a team buy-in. You're not going to push this through. You're not going to force this upon people. You really have to look at your environment and say, are we doing this as well as we can be? Most people are going to, some people will think they are, and most people will realize they, there's always room for improvement. And configuration management can be one step in that room for improvement. M collective versus an SSH for loop could be a, a, you know, another aspect of that improvement. How do we do things con consistently, efficiently? How do we service requests for, for people on our team? Uh, and the one last thing, I think I'm wrapping up in the next four minutes, the one last thing I kind of want to leave you guys with, um, this idea of taking your environment back. Um, Puppet provides the, the ability to actually handle these hosts, scale them, configure them, make sure they look the same as you expect them to look. Forming gives you a quick way to really manage things. Just, oh yeah, everything looks good, cool. Um, and to kind of augment hosts as needed. M Collective is that day-to-day, -day, I need to do grunt work, I'm a sysadmin type stuff. Nigeos Immunin, if you guys don't have monitoring, if you don't have metrics, if you don't, if you don't baseline your environment, um, maybe this is a good reason to do that. 
we actually deploy, uh, I work for a managed service provider, we actually are going to be deploying across all of our customers Puppet for the simple reason of Unit and Nodules automatically deploying monitoring. Um, so the, the last and the biggest idea here is that within the scope of configuration management, the, I think the necessity has been present for a lot of years, but the necessity and the reason why it's an EC2 talk specifically is because there's so much out there that we can really leverage, and it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of lame of us not to actually take all this brand new technology and all of this you know, cheap computing power and actually do something with it rather than say we have great plans and no way to execute upon it. So um, this is my contact information. I'll be heading upstairs um, just after this. And I really appreciate your time and hope you guys got something out of it. Thank you. If you have